This is an HP News Network special report. Okay, YouTubers and anti-nuke activists, welcome to another special report of the HP News Network with your host, Patrick Penry. Okay, first things first, today I'm reminding people, you're just a few days away this weekend, September 28th, Kevin Blanche will be in Washington Square, New York at 1 p.m. It's really, it's like a meeting of the minds, okay? He's very clear about what he wants to do and what he doesn't want to do. And it's totally different. This thing is totally different. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to subscribe to his YouTube channel and get caught up in the last couple of weeks of his dialogue there because he's been promoting this and talking about this for some time. So this is your opportunity, if nothing else, to go out and meet Mr. Blanche and ask him some questions. I mean, he's a wealth of information. He's a storage unit full of information. Go out there and, and ask him questions and get some. I mean, how often do you have a chance to ask someone a question in this particular area, the nuclear industry, and get a real honest, forthright answer? I mean, a genuine answer, not scripted, not prompted, no talking points, no Q&A, no press release. He'll just answer your question right off the top of his head. And that's how you know he's genuine. So if you're in New York and you're near Washington Square on the 28th of this month, September 28th, 2013, 1 p.m., be there. Okay, Be there and learn about nuclear power. Talk about nuclear power and what's going on with it. We're in a crisis situation. Okay, the first thing I want to do with this special report, I want to jump right in. I want to cover a couple things today. I want to cover the lack of a Diablo evacuation plan. I want to cover a little thing I call where the wind blows. We're going to look at some measured plume maps from Fukushima. Measured, not modeled. These are actual measured plumes. And I think you'll find, as I did, some of these are 60 kilometers long. 60 kilometers long. And also we're going to talk about slurry and goop. Okay, These were a couple of methods they were discussing the possibility of employing uh, at Fukushima the goop is to spray on the ground and keep these resuspension of particles to keep a resuspension of particles in other words you're moving around you're stirring up dust you don't want to breathe that in the goop was to be sprayed on the ground to kind of hold that stuff down and the slurry is something some sand and some other concoction they were going to pour into the spent fuel pool because it was that bad and finally I'm going to finish this HP news broadcast with I want to reveal to you what I found the NRC's greatest fear is. That's right, folks. I have found evidence of what the NRC fears more than anything in this world. No, it's not a 200-foot-tall, fire-breathing Godzilla mutated reptilian up from the waters of Japan. It's something totally different, something totally different. So let's have a look at that. First, let's dig into the Diablo lack of an evacuation plan. This should disturb you greatly. If you have children, if you have loved ones, if you care about human beings, if you don't like cancer and thyroid problems and Fukushima heart, Chernobyl heart, and all the problems that come with low level or even high level fallout, okay, this should disturb you greatly. Now this first screen captures from a March 21st email from the NRC, Freedom of Information Act documents free and available to the public online. And in this particular email, from V-Ray that don't really get a lot of information on who this person is. This NRC allegation, and this is just something someone sent in or made contact with the NRC and wrote them something, and, and they're very, uh, what's the word, very conscious of who's saying what. And so this came up as something they were concerned with. And the person goes on to say, U.S. nuclear generating stations, actually I should back up a second, subject, nuclear safety accident preparations, and response training may be inadequate. U.S. nuclear generating stations hold routine training drills, etc., for the worst case postulated credible single failure event. Based upon multiple units at the same site failing in Japan, it is no longer credible that an analyzed accident only affects one unit at a multiple unit site. Shouldn't it now be a requirement for multiple unit sites to analyze and set up the emergency response facilities to handle all units at a site simultaneously? Up to now, it has been considered an unlikely event for a string of failures at one site to occur at the adjacent unit. But clearly, one tsunami wave, a single failure initiating event, affected all units at a given site in Japan. If I am correct, 
then no U.S. multi-unit site is set up to deal with more than a single unit failure at a time. I think prudently this should now be looked at as a credible failure and proper preparations taken to ensure if this were to happen at a U.S. facility, then the utility is not in a position that there is insufficient people, emergency response facilities, etc., to deal with a simultaneous multi-unit emergency. Possibly, this advanced preparations would prevent the release of radioactive materials to the U.S. environment, such as what is happening in Japan, as they, by admission, were not prepared to handle a multi-unit failure. V. Ray Foster, Jr. Excellent letter, uh, Mr. Foster. And I put this one in here to show you, I want to show you the lack of preparedness if something big goes down over here. Okay, this shows right here, and the guy makes an excellent argument that, hey, if it's too much for... Japan to handle uh, multiple meltdowns and you only plan for a credible single failure event, what happens if multiples happen over here? Do you have a plan for that? Hello, hello, NRC. Uh, protect people and environment. What, what are you doing down there? Okay, the next screen capture. This is the mind blower, okay? In conjunction with what we just talked about, a multi-unit accident they're not prepared for. This one's from Bill Meyer, uh, sent to Richard Turtle, Rosetta, Virgilio, I think that's one of the parents of Marty. Uh, LIAO4 Hawk, that's kind of a committee, so this is going to a bunch of people. Subject, forward, county health officer contact request. I contacted the Ventura County Health Officer named below on March 30th. By the way, this is April 4, 2011 is the date of this letter. I contacted the Ventura County Health Officer named below on March 30th and discussed the general principles of 10 mile and 50 mile emergency planning zones. I avoided any discussion of what doses would be in his county for a Diablo Canyon worst case condition release scenario. He had evidently thought a great deal about whether or not a Fukushima or Chernobyl scenario could have an impact on Ventura County if it occurred at Diablo Canyon. One design area that I touched on was the general differences between U.S. commercial nuclear reactors and the Soviet RBMK design, graphite versus water moderator and containment design. Okay, here's the kicker. His most pressing question was whether or not he needed to have some sort of emergency planning basis, e.g., in other words, canned public messages, identify the state of California as a valuable partner to consult in making that decision, given the state's role of providing protective action recommendations to the potentially affected counties. I also advise that Ventura County contact the power plant staff to get as much information from them to make an informed decision of whether or not to adopt some preliminary planning features in the event of a release of radioactive material from the Diablo Canyon power plant. I provided contact information for a manager in California Emergency Management Agency and the off-site emergency planner at Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant. The power plant emergency planner informed me that she and a San Luis Obispo County official planned for an upcoming visit with the Ventura County Health Department to conduct further discussions. This should close out the final action for this request on the FSME SharePoint site. So what we see here is at least at April 4, 2011, in Ventura County, California, right near Diablo, that's the county Diablo is in, there's no real emergency planning guide. There's no procedure. It doesn't appear to be that there's anything in place in case there's an accident to get people out, to take precautions, to take emergency measures, to evacuate, anything of that. This is just incredible. This is absolutely mind-boggling that you'd build a nuclear plant but not have some kind of procedure for getting people out of there in the event something goes wrong. Well, according to NRC, if you look at their report on the spent fuel pool situation, the chances of something going wrong at a spent fuel pool are so cosmically low, we have nothing to worry about. Okay, and this is just an incredible bit of documentation here from Bill Meyer that do they need to have some sort of EP planning basis? Question. Given the state's rule providing protective action recommendations to the potentially affected counties, this is interesting because, again, the next screen capture I'm going to show you, they put so much off on the state. They say, well, the state can make this decision. The state will know that and contact the state, and, and the state will figure this out. But, again, I show you in multiple instances where they withhold critical information from the state because it's damning information that shows casts a very negative light on the nuclear power industry. And let's take a look at that. This is many of you may have seen this now. 
from a briefing in the FOIA documents, and Mark Schaefer at IAEA has requested permission to share the NRC situation report with the Chinese government. OIP was advised this document should not be shared. Concerns with any plan to share the SITREP with the Chinese government are, one, U.S. states have been denied access to this document. And two, if we share the document with the Chinese government, this precedent could obligate us to honor requests from other international stakeholders as well. As we learned with the New York Times article, we need to safeguard against leaks of official use only information. Okay, so right there, the SIT rep report is denied U.S. states. They didn't get to know what was in that situation report. And I put it to you, it's because it was incredible. It was a prolonged station blackout. They had multiple meltdowns, China syndrome, spent fuel pool, melt on the floor. It was the worst case, the worst it could possibly be, or darn near close to it. And that they did not want U.S. states to know that because then what would we do? Take necessary precautions? And that's a little thunder in the background if you're hearing that. I'm in Florida here and we're getting some rain today. So it's a good thing to get rain. I'll continue on, thunder or not. Okay, and here's another screen cap I got right here. It shows you, I, quote, I distributed a version of this document with the non-public information removed to the Region 1 states. <laughs> okay, that means this particular set of information, non-public, it wasn't for the public. They withhold that and they send the rest on to the states. The states are being treated like the public. Okay, on a need-to-know basis, we're left in the dark. They don't even want the states to have all the information. If you're a state legislator or a state politician, you should be angry. You should be very angry for this. this is not the way to conduct business. But again, if they're up front and forthright with the information, you find out just how bad nuclear power is early on. And then you realize it is incumbent upon all of us to get involved to shut this down. There's no other choice. There's no other option but decommissioning all reactors as soon as possible. We have to release suppressed technology. There's thousands of patents being suppressed. You cannot have a solar cell more than 20% efficiency. You cannot have a power system greater than 70% efficiency or it can be seized upon by the patent office and restricted. And there's other ways to keep you from bringing your technology to market. Intimidation, murder, you name it. Bribery, extortion, and buy the guy off. That's what we're looking at here. So it, while on one hand they say, well, get with the states. They'll help you figure out how to evacuation plan. What, how's that going to work when you withhold critical information from the states? How can they make an important decision without that information? How can they make an informed decision about an evacuation procedure when you won't give them all the information on Fukushima? Right? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, let's look at the next section of this HP News Network special report. And what we want to do is look at, I call this where the wind blows. Now, I mentioned earlier plumes that were 60 kilometers measured plumes, actually measured plumes. That means they were real, they are verifiable, it's not a model. We knew, we know that they existed. Okay, 60 kilometers is 37 miles long. So when I tell you I have evidence of measured plumes from Fukushima, 37 miles long. If you live near Indian Point, if you live near Diablo, Turkey Point, whatever you're at, keep in mind when there's a catastrophic meltdown and or when a spent fuel pool goes up, you can have extremely long plumes of radiation. Okay, let's dig right into these documents and let's look at some of these measured plumes. The first screen cap we're looking at shows you they're keenly interested. It's from the 29th of March, 2011. It shows you they're keenly interested in wind direction. These arrows indicate wind direction. If you see the swirl pattern right near the top of this one, it was basically bringing everything to that area, and that's where your fallout was concentrated right there. So keep in mind, where do the plumes go? Well, where does the wind blow? All throughout this event and in these documents, they state that the plumes are moving with the direction of the wind. A lot of the time it's blowing offshore, but when it's not blowing offshore, there's mention of a plume that goes down the coastline far enough to reach Tokyo and then blow across Tokyo, okay, back in the other direction. So they're very keenly interested in wind direction. Okay, now next screen capture we're looking, we're beginning to look at measured plumes, and these are in chronological sequential order. I didn't include every single one, but a point I should make is that at times the plume was lengthy and at times it was short, so emanations would produce a burst or a, a large emission and a large plume would come out and then as that would taper off the plume would shorten and then you see the plume would lengthen as there were more emissions or at least that's what I interpreted out of these 
out of these measured plume maps here. And if you look at the right hand side of this particular screen cap, you can see the measurements. You can't read the Japanese script, or maybe you can if you're very educated, but the rest of us have to look down and see the 1 by 10 to the negative 15, 5 by 10 to the negative 16, and that's showing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in the different areas of the plume, the intensity, the concentration of the radioactivity. And this one's not very long, as you see by the scale at the bottom of the map. 0 to 20 to 40 to 60 kilometers. This is maybe a 20 kilometer plume here from 329, 2011 at 12, from 12 to 13 UTC time, Zulu time, military time. From 14 to 15 you can see the plume begin to elongate and stretch and curve towards the mainland. Next screen cap 329, 2011 from 15 to 16 UTC time, same plume, straightened out a little bit right down the coast. Next screen cap, plumes a little bit longer, from 16 to 17 UTC time. It's a little bit longer and it bends inland now. Next screen capture again, notice the where did the wind blow? That was what was carrying and shaping the plume. This is from 329, 2011, from 17 to 18 UTC. Okay, next screen cap, from 18 to 19, like I said, sometimes the plume would kind of disappear. That's because there's this burst of emanations. There will be a like a burn down, a meltdown, fires, radioactivity plume release. When that burns down, the plume naturally shortens. And here it is between 18 and 19 UTC. It's much shorter of a plume. 19 to 20, we're looking at the next screen cap. See, it's right there sitting over the particular site itself in this screen cap. It's not moving a lot. Okay, now in the next screen cap, we see it going out to sea. It's kind of widening, get a teardrop shape. Again, this is a measured plume. This is a real actual plume that existed on 329 of 2011 between 20 to 21 UTC. That's military time, Zulu time. Okay, now in this next screen capture, the plume is beginning to lengthen. And we've got over a 20 kilometer plume here from 330. This will be the next following day from 16 to 17 UTC. So following day, we're getting some more emanations and a plume is coming out. Okay, now in this next screen cap, we're getting into the lengthy plumes from 330, 2011, from 17 to 18 UTC. And folks, wow, now we're really get to a 40, we're really getting to a 40 plus kilometer plume here. And this is incredibly worrisome when you look at the reality of when there is a catastrophic meltdown, how far these plumes can stretch. And if you go to the NRC website, log on and look at their map of where the reactors are in this country and where the population centers are. You know, 6% of our population lives within 50 kilometers of Indian Point. Of course, that's what my studies have shown me back from, I think, 2010. That was some kind of summary there. So there's a high density population centers nearby and plumes stretch up to 60 kilometers long for sure and beyond beyond 60 kilometers there's still emanations it's just not so much they're going to put out the measurement and the data it goes to a certain level and tapers off and that's what they're concerned with above a threshold they're reporting so here's one going to the north over land leaving deposition this is fallout this is a measured plume from 330 2011 from 17 to 18 utc time Again, next screen cap, same plume, even longer, 18 to 19 UTC time. This is a massive plume, and now this one's stretched off screen, and this is where I'm getting into 50 plus kilometer plumes here. Okay, the next screen cap from the 31st, the next day, from 19 to 20 UTC, there's a large, long, lengthy plume, and it goes out to sea. And there's plenty of discussion that the plumes are blowing out to sea. Of course, they also blow inland too, but for most of this event, the plumes are blowing out to sea. Again, next screen cap. This is a doozy right here. And this is one, if you, if you look at the scale at the bottom of the map, and in some of these that are 60 kilometers long, part of the plume goes off screen. You have to account for the tapering end of the plume. And when you do that, I've measured them at 60 plus kilometers long. And this one is darn near close to 60. If it's not, it's for sure 50 kilometers long. And remember, 60 kilometers is 37 miles. Ah, maybe we picked up that thunder. Wow, what a crack of thunder. We're getting a lot of rain in Florida. I can't complain. I love the rain, folks. Next screen cap. And the reason I'm including some of these into the next month, I want to show you that these plumes were ongoing for months. 
for months. They measured plumes for months. It wasn't four to five days, Obama. It wasn't 96 hours, Elliot Brenner. Okay, it was for months. Substantial plumes for months were ongoing. This was a massive, un, you know, let me just say this. This planet has never seen an accident on this scale before. Chernobyl pales in comparison to Fukushima. You cannot compare the two because one is so much more massive in scope, much more monumental, just this massive, not one that they entombed, mind you. This is one that was left to burn. They tried to pour water on it, salt water, I give you that, but it couldn't get there in time, and this stuff just burned down to the worst degree. So this is far worse than Chernobyl. They do not want you to know that. And these are measured, ongoing plumes for many months, many months after the incident. Okay, this next screen capture from the four, from April 1, 2011, 13 to 14. Previous map was 12 to 13. This one's 13 to 14. Some of these are direct sequential order. And you can see that plume from the previous screen cap, which was you know 20 plus kilometers long, is now much longer. It's 35 to 40 kilometers long, or maybe more. So this plume is growing. There's an emission on the first of April. There is an emission coming from this plant, a measured emission. There's the numbers right there on the mid right screen. Becquerels per meter cubed. Okay, again from April 1st, from 14 to 15 UTC. I've given you a sequence from 12 to 13 to 14 to 15. Now there's your plume moving around and growing in size and scope. It's very alarming for me because this is the reality when they mention they want to build reactors plural in Levy County. When I looked at that from my position in Gainesville, Florida, that's near Crystal River, they are it's about 70 kilometers away. It's within this plume distance for me. And so at that point I knew this is real. This nuclear threat is very real because it's in my backyard. Crystal River was already in my backyard, but they want to build another one. You know, another one. Crystal River is shut down because of a crack in the containment. And it's never gonna be uh, cranked back up again. They cannot repair it. Something to keep in mind when you you look at your position on the map and compare it to the nuclear power plants. Hey, how close are you to a nuclear power plant? You should ask yourself that question. And then you should investigate the Tooth Fairy project. Maybe I'll put a link to that in this presentation too. Okay, next screen cap from April 1st from 19 to 20 UTC. Look at the size of that plume. Look at the width of it. And look at the length of it. That is just a massive plume almost a month later from the date of the tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Incredible, just incredible. Again, 4-1-2011 from 20 to 21 UTC. This next screen cap is just an incredible wide swath of radioactive plume and a lengthy plume as well. Measured plume now. This is not a model. This was a real, real plume that existed on that date at that time. Where did it go? Well, it's called fallout. It lands somewhere, doesn't it? Some floats in the atmosphere for a long time, but the heavier particles, they have to land in the ocean, on land, on people. Next screen capture from the first, again, I'm giving you sequential order here. You can kind of follow these and see how that plume blows around. And now this next one skips over to the 2nd of April from 23 to double knot, double knot on UTC, which is also military Zulu time. And look at that massive plume. This is one, folks, that if you, if you look off screen and you continue the best fit scenario for this and you taper it off, you are looking at a 60 plus kilometer plume. That is 37 miles, 37 miles. If you look at the Indian Point map, and I'll throw that in here, there's a lot of people within 37 miles of Indian Point, okay? Incredible numbers of people there. So this is very serious. And this quickly, let me mention that I have another video and article coming out on Unit 4 where again, I debunk this alternative media propaganda that the worst has not already happened there. Now, why is alternative media spewing this out right now? They're obviously controlled, and this is a bit of propaganda. Well, the NRC is conducting these public meetings, and they're questioning, again, our spent fuel crisis here in America, our stored-up, spent-used fuel that's accumulating and accumulating. It's a very dangerous situation. They want you to think that the worst hasn't happened at Fukushima, and that a spent fuel pool fire can't and probably won't happen. And if it does, they can handle it and control it and it'll be okay. And that is not the case. They do not want you to know that the thing they feared most was Unit 3 and Unit 4 spent fuel pool having a meltdown, right? That's what they feared the most. The emissions from that are incredible according to my studies looking at the NRC's own documents. So keep that in mind. They, they do not want you to know 
what really happened there because it shines a negative light on the nuclear industry and to such a degree that once you understand the reality of nuclear power in our situation it is frightening it is disturbing it should shake you up and you should realize you have no alternative no other choice but to get involved and to help help us shut this stuff down and release suppressed technologies it's a twofold deal you can't just decommission nuclear power and expect us to run on coal you have to release suppressed technologies. You must understand what a monopoly is. Because the energy monopoly is why we're using nuclear power and they want the nuclear weapons. Okay, the next screen captures from the 4th of April. Again, I'm showing you day after day after day after day, there's emissions ongoing for many weeks afterwards. At least measured amounts that are measurable, worth measuring, and producing a map of the plume. From 4-4-2011, from 8 to 9 UTC time, Fukushima, Japan. Here's your plume. And from a little bit more that day, from the 9th to the 10th hour on that day, the plume's extended, going out to sea, curving around. Next screen cap, same day, 10 to 11 UTC time, plume is even longer, curving around. This is an incredible plume on the 4th of April, almost a month after the tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Okay, in this next screen cap, here you go. I didn't include the Indian point, and you can just look at what all is within the 10 miles, the 17.5 mile zone, which is also kind of roughly covers that Chernobyl zone. And then the 50 mile, they call it the peak injury zone, but now we know in Fukushima there can be up to a 50 mile evacuation zone. A 50 mile evacuation zone. We know that's possible because it's already happened at least once. They said an earthquake of that magnitude wasn't possible and it happened. Okay, so now we know it to be possible. I've showed you real plumes that really go that far. Okay, it's don't get much more real than this, folks. Okay, now that was what I wanted to show you on where the wind blows, and I'm going to revisit some of that in a report I have coming up I call Tokyo versus New York because I want to show you again the real plumes, compare the information I have on what happened to Tokyo because there's plenty of information that Tokyo got blasted. And then we want to look at New York, and we will look at, look at the evacuation. We want to say, you can't really get, you can't evacuate people. Same with Tokyo. They couldn't make an announcement and say, yes, you're getting hammered with radiation, because what are you going to do with all the people in Tokyo? Tell them to get out? I mean, seriously. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about slurry and goop. And again, some of this I'm going to cover in my uh, Unit 4 compendium. I'm calling it Fear and Loathing at Fukushima Unit 4 because it seems to be a massive campaign of propaganda and fear-mongering going on. And I want to set the record straight in their own words on Unit 4. And that's what I intend to do. Now let's talk about goop. Because this is important, it shows just how bad it is when one of these catastrophic meltdowns, plural, goes down. They're having to spray this resin. And I'll read it to you. Goop. An assessment was made to determine the ramifications for a coat use in the spent fuel pools. Fukushima Daiichi personnel are planning to spray a resin. Well, this says for use in the spent fuel pools, mixture, a resin mixture to fix loose radioactive materials in the plants. And maybe they use it in the pool too. But that was my understanding. I have evidence where they say they covered this um, amount of area on the east side. They covered this amount on the west side of spraying this resin down to do what? To, to avoid resuspension of particulates. You have dust, radioactive dust, small particles as you move around and equipment's driving by, you're stirring up the dust, you're stirring up the particles. This resin tends to hold that down. It's like turning a sprinkler on and keeping the particles down on the ground essentially, but this would be a more permanent type thing you would spray over and kind of would coat everything and hold it to the ground. That's how bad it is. I told you, 300, 400 rem and in some places 40 rem and we have chunks and particles. I mean, it's catastrophic. You can't even send personnel in until the bulldozers bulldoze the stuff into piles and cut the shine back enough, right? Okay, now here's the, here's really a kicker. Briefing sheet on spent fuel pool slurry. This document was initiated at the request of the NRC site team to support a briefing by Chuck Casto of the American Ambassador. It is intended to outline the technical issues associated with addition of a quote-unquote slurry, i.e., in other words, sand or other materials, to the spent fuel pool for Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4 and provide views based on available information. Now, did they add a slurry mixture to any of the spent fuel pools? Not to my knowledge, and I'm told they did not by Shazam. And, and there's kind of a, a bit of 
propaganda and disinformation going. I forget who it was. I think someone with IAEA flew over in a, in a plane or helicopter, observed the Fukushima Daiichi site not long after, and, and was saying that the sand and stuff they had poured out was smoking and burning. Well, that's not the case. What it was a multiple meltdowns is what was causing the burning and smoke. Sand, to my knowledge, was never added. But what we need to do is look at this and say, what do we extrapolate from this? Well, we know they were considering adding sand, and the slurry was chunks of lead and other ingredients in this sand slurry mixture, and they were going to pour it into the pool because, again, why would they consider that? Well, I put it to you that because the worst of the worst happened. They said, look, we got to melt on the floor. We've got a crack. We can't get water in there. We've got radiation venting directly to the atmosphere. Let's pour this sand slurry in there with chunks of lead and hope that maybe it kind of contains some of the radiation. That's the only thing, the only reason this would be considered is that the situation was so bad with spent fuel pool number four, and maybe number three, that they had to consider, hey, maybe we should pour sand and chunks of lead in there, right? And that's very indicative that what they're trying to convince you in number four, that there's still, the fuel rods are still there and it's dangerous pulling them out, so on and so forth. Yeah, that that's, you know, I see evidence contrary to that, contrary to that. And in my spent fuel pool, a number four, the fear and loathing at Fukushima Unit 4 is coming up. Uh, I'm going to, a massive amount of evidence that I'm going to counter and debunk alternative media's propaganda. Remember, mainstream's just silent on it. They don't even want to talk about spent fuel pool number four, hardly. And alternative seems to be pushing uh, a bit of propaganda that's, it's almost like when Jon Stewart shows you that the mainstream media, ABC, CBS, NBC, all kind of report the same thing, even using the same catchphrases and slogans and words and stuff like that. It's almost as if one person writes the reports for all those uh, news outlets, ABC, CBS, NBC. If you've seen Jon Stewart on Comedy Central, it's almost laughable when you look at it. It's like one person writes for all of those guys, right? Well, the same thing in alternative media. It's no different. You got your Burger King, got your McDonald's, got your Pepsi, got your Coke, got your Republicans, got your Democrat, got your mainstream got your alternative media. An alternative, they're dealing with what I call the second herd. Okay, you can call the first herd a sheeple, the mainstream people. Okay, and the second herd is kind of skeptical. They think they've woken up. Now they're going to these bogus outlets for information. They don't realize yet that a trap's been laid for them. And all these outlets are just given disinformation or gatekeeping, withholding certain information or fear mongering, saying, oh my God, if Unit 4 collapses, we're all going to, there's so much fuel in there. Well, they don't want to tell you that fuel's already melted down. In my compendium on Unit 4, you're going to see so much incredible evidence to controvert what the establishment mouthpieces are saying, and that includes alternative media, much of alternative media. And here's just a little bit of evidence, this will be in it, that they were considering a sand and uh, lead slurry to pour into spent fuel pool number 4. It was that bad. It was that bad. Now, you don't have to do that if the water's retained and nothing melts. That wouldn't make sense, right? Okay, and that pretty much sums up that on the goop and on the slurry. And now I want to finish this HP News Network special report by revealing to you the NRCs what they fear the most. What keeps them up at night? What does keep the NRC up at night? What keeps Elliot Brenner up at night? What keeps Marty Virgilio up at night? What keeps... David McIntyre up at night. What keeps the ones that haven't jumped ship already and disappeared since Fukushima up at night? Well, here it is from a March 16th email from Suno Cody, strange last name, to some of the usual suspects. I see Kathy Gibson's in there. She's one that downplayed the modeling and why our Navy sailors got so sick. It says, Mike, Doug, and Stu. Region 1 is getting ready to perform end of cycle meetings with regional licensees. Ironically, our first end of cycle is scheduled at Three Mile Island. As you know, these are public meetings. Region 1 is expecting sophisticated, informed members of the public to show up at these meetings. As such, regional management is performing necessary thinking and preparation at this time. That's the only important thing you need to know about this email right here. Let me read that back to you one time. As you know, these are public meetings. And might I add, there's public meetings coming up in regards to our waste fuel situation. I'm going to give you a link to that in a special video. And I'm going to give you 
all the cities and addresses and places where they're going to do this, and I'm going to give you information to take there. If you want to make a public statement, I'm going to arm you with the best of the best from these documents so you can show up in their own words, show them what they already know. Okay, and let me continue reading. As you know, these are public meetings. Region 1 is expecting sophisticated, informed members of the public to show up at these meetings. As such, regional management is performing necessary thinking and preparation at this time. Now, you know what that means, folks. I don't even should need to elaborate on this except to say this and end on this. They fear most sophisticated, informed members of the public. You know, nuclear power has existed for all these years because there's an epidemic of ignorance in this country. There are so many people who know so little about nuclear power. They have been able to perpetuate this most dangerous, deadly monopoly for many, many years. We've lost untold millions now. Untold millions. If you add up all... And there's a sodium reactor meltdown too in Simi Valley I'm reading about. They totally covered it up, folks. If you look at the damage we've sustained in lives, property, the treasure we've lost spending to rectify these situations at Hanford, so on and so forth. This only exists because there's an epidemic of ignorance. If the population is enlightened, if the people are told the facts, they're intelligent enough to make an informed decision. The problem is the government won't give them the facts, industry won't give them the facts, media, alternative media will not give them the facts. So we are not able to make an informed decision. But I tell you now, and I end on this, they fear more than anything else a massive population of sophisticated, informed, critical thinkers, the American public. And so, as Kevin Blanche says, this is post-ignorance. I have been ignorant. I am still educating myself. We've all been ignorant. Hey, let's get informed. Let's get sophisticated. And let's get down to these public meetings. I'll give you a future link in a video coming up to this series of meetings they're going to have on waste management and I want to give you information so if you want to go to these you can show up and you can in their own words show them what they already know about the spent fuel crisis right here in this country okay that sums up this special report from the HP News Network this is as always Hattrick Hattie Penry reporting have a rad free day over and out this has been an HP News Network special report. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video. And, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.